Welcome to Women Winning Divorce. I am your host, Heather Quick. I am an attorney, entrepreneur, author, and founder of Florida Women's Law Group, the only divorce firm for women by women. I love thinking big, thinking outside the box, creating creative solutions for women and empowering women to win in all aspects of their life. Our approach at Florida Women's Law Group is to provide women with a strategy to not only achieve their objectives, but win at life. I believe that what may show up as adversity is simply an opportunity to change and improve your life. In each episode, I sit down with innovative professionals and leaders who are focused on how you can be your best self before, during, and after divorce. In these conversations, we are looking at how women can win at life. I have the unique opportunity to meet women when they are at a transition period of life, but that is only the beginning to becoming your best self and winning at life on your terms. With our guests, we enjoy the opportunity to explore ways all women can win and enhance their life, no matter where they are in their journey, because divorce is just a point in life, not the end and not what defines you, rather a catalyst for your growth. Welcome to today's podcast of Women Winning Divorce. I'm Heather Quick, owner and attorney at Florida Women's Law Group. Now today we have a special surprise for you because we are going to do some Q&A with my assistant, J.D. Fleischer. Um, She's going to be asking some questions, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Welcome, J.D. Hi, Heather. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to get started. Well, I am so happy to have you here. And once again, for our listeners, this is... This is to help you really, uh, so that we can answer questions that we know you guys have been having and hopefully provide great information um, for you as you are maybe entering the divorce process, thinking about it, or even in the middle of it. All right. So, JD, today uh, I'm going to be asking, I'm going to be answering your questions about like how to hire the right attorney. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. That is correct. And I think we're going to start off with a pretty easy one for our listeners. So first question is, do you need an attorney to go through and divorce? Um, Yes, that is like, you know, asking a doctor if you need, you know, a a surgeon to to operate on you or should you just get the how to manual on your own? It just depends on how much you're attached to maybe that limb or whatever as far as surgery. Same with a divorce. Depends how much you're attached to your assets, your liabilities, or your children. Um, If you care about that, then you need a professional um, to suggest that you can learn this on your own and protect your interest is a, um, I think it's just very naive and foolish. Even if you are an attorney, but don't, even if you are an attorney and you practice family law, you want to have an attorney who can be objective and help you through this process. So absolutely, you need an attorney. Now, when selecting that attorney, is there a certain type of attorney or a personality type that you should be looking out for uh, throughout your divorce? Yes. Now, and this one is, this is not just a straightforward, I can give you these things that you're, you know, these are the top five things that you need. It's, you definitely need an attorney who listens to you. Um, and the only way of knowing that is by meeting them. You need someone, an attorney, clearly who's smart um, and who hears what you have to say and is going to create a strategy for you to achieve your goals. You need an attorney who even asks you what your goals are. Where do you want to end up after this? Um, not someone who's just spouting out the law and telling you the way it's going to be. Um, to me, that is, you're wanting somebody you're hiring an expert, but to guide you, but also collaborate with you in the process. Okay. That makes sense. So I know you mentioned a few things that people should look for in an attorney. I'm curious now about the type of law. Um, Should it be family law specific? Say my cousin is a personal injury attorney. Could they process my divorce? Uh, That would be um, if you don't care about (laughs) the results. And I, and I mean that, and it sounds flippant, but honestly, um, you the law is so complicated, and it has it has become more complicated. I think that you know most people would agree our world just in general, right? And that's why we see more and more specialization focusing 
on certain types of the law because they're so complicated. And frankly, certainly, you know us and be like, oh, you're a family law attorney. Can you help me with this car accident, this personal injury? Absolutely not. Like, okay, yeah, maybe I could read the statute, but I've got, you know, we've got each attorney has so many years of experience. I don't even know what our collective experience is, but, um, you know, certainly uh, like 50, over 50 years, I know, um, you know, right. Like you can't replace that by reading the statute in a few cases. So you really want someone who understands the intricacy of it so that you're protected because they may say, well, they can write it up, but like, it's the things that don't get put in agreements often they create the most trouble and expensive, you know, trying to go back and get them fixed after the fact. Now, say you do have one of those complex situations, such as you might have a business together or you have multiple homes, um, or maybe your ex is a narcissist. Are those reasons to look for more specific things in a family law attorney when you're searching for an attorney? I do think so. I think that is valid to ask those questions. Um, it is, you are not going to have the same experience with a, you know, a, a brand new attorney that you are with an experienced attorney. And then, you know, you go to experienced attorneys, it is going to be different. You will have there, you know, there are certainly many, um, who've been practicing a long time. They may just tell you what to do. They may not be interested in your insight, um, as to what you want to get out of it, but Certainly, you know, when we're dealing with large um, assets and estates and businesses, you you certainly want somebody who has experience because we know what experts are good, which ones we like to work with, which ones we feel like do the best job. And we're experienced in doing that. So we understand, hey, we have a business valuation where we have a high, you know, an alimony case. Alimony law has changed, of course, but there's still, there's still things that um, go into that that you're going to want that experience. And, you know, the, I do want to touch on that narcissism um, issue because I, we do talk, we, I've talked about it a lot because many women find themselves in that situation. And so often um, you are as a client, you know, what I have found in my experience is you're looking for somebody to listen to you and understand. Mm -hmm. Um we may not be able to change, we're not going to be able to change him, but we can at least hear you and come up with strategies to still help you get your, to achieve your goals. So I, I do think that it's, it's important to, if you, you know, do that um, when you're, you know, kind of doing your um, due diligence before you, you meet with an attorney. Now, on the other side of that, are there any red flags you'd advise our listeners to look out for when choosing an attorney? Um, yes. The number one is how many areas of law do they practice? Um, and, and most attorneys will know this, you know, do they practice door law, meaning they represent anybody who comes through the door? Mm. That's not a great idea. Um, it is quite difficult, or I'm going to say challenging, to be up to date, up to date in the case law and on what's going on in more than one area, in my opinion and experience, um, because their new case is published like three times a week. Now they're going to cover various areas, but the, you're wanting the attorney who is focused on family law, not on real estate closings or personal injury, because those laws have things coming out a lot as well. Um, so that's where you are looking for that focus on the area where you are hiring them for, which is divorce and family law. That makes sense. Um, something I hear a lot is how you communicate with your attorney is very crucial to your experience throughout this process. How do you ensure that you'll communicate effectively with your attorney? That is a great question because uh, you need to, you do need to have that conversation and understand as my attorney, are you going to call me on the telephone? Some firms or some attorneys would say, no, we are only going to email you. That may not work for you. Some clients may say, 
I don't want you to call me on the phone. And your attorney's like, no, we are going to call you. I mean, nowadays, everybody, of course, has email and has, most have text. You know, we have that ability through our software. But we do ask our clients, how do you want to be communicated with? Um, and, and we'll do our best. But some, you know, news should, you know, you as the attorney, we do make decisions. You know, is this news that can be communicated in writing? Um, you know, via just verbally or in person, right? There are certain things that need that, you know, we make that judgment on what's the best way to communicate it. And I think that's really important to ask because I, um, uh, you know, not to, to make myself sound like some old, <laughs> um, non-tech person, but, um, this we are in we are in a relationship an attorney client client relationship mm -hmm. in my experience of my many years on this planet relationships are most effective when there's good communication and that requires in person you know communications mm -hmm. zoom has allowed for that to help in many ways when people you know because many of our clients don't even live here right and so better than telephone at least you can look somebody in the eye but 10 years ago, if we had somebody who didn't live here, it was all via telephone, um, the majority of the communication. So I, I think it's important that you express your preferences. I think it's important that they ask you. And then I think also you need to recognize I can't afford, and even if I can't afford, you should not want, expect to talk to your attorney every single day or that law office, you should expect to have a plan and work the plan and, and, and have, and maybe ask that how many, and what kind of intervals are we going to touch base and communicate? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, for most, the majority of our listeners, they've never hired an attorney before when you're, you know, entering this arena, a family law. So you really don't know what you don't know. And I would say almost all clients want to be a good client. Of course, us as attorneys, we want to, you know, be a good attorney for you, but that's where we're sometimes we have to come up with the ground rules that this is the best way for this relationship to work. And this is the best way for us to communicate. Now, I'm curious about your opinion. W would you say it's advantageous to go with a firm rather than a solo practitioner or vice versa? Um, so I think there are pros and cons to to both, really. Um, and, and, and I'll tell you this, like back in the day, you know, many, many years ago when it was just me, which I, I can hardly think back to that, but I communicated with my clients. I didn't have a secretary of paralegal. So Basically, every time they talked to me, they paid what I was charging all the time. Because I didn't have a paralegal, because I didn't have any help, sometimes it took a while. It took a lot longer, you know, twice as long for everything to get done, sometimes twice as long to get communicated. And, you know, I, when I was early in the stages of building the practice, I had, I had an situation, situation where my son, he was still a baby and he got really sick and had to go to the hospital. So of course I went with him, no clients. I, 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 don't, I was not in a frame of mind to talk to any client, to help them with anything, to do anything. So I had to, I just had to withdraw, send them somewhere else. And that is not a position um, as an attorney I wanted to be in because I, you know, um, I, I, the firm was pretty small at that time, but I, I, I couldn't help everybody. And everybody had to be on hold based on my personal life versus when you have a firm, um, you ideally uh, like what we've built our firm to be so that, um, you know, your attorney has a baby. Okay. Um, they're going to be gone. They should be gone. You should want your attorney, you know, obviously to have that time off so that they can come back. Um, but we have a whole nother team of attorneys to fill in, to, you know, take care of it. If somebody gets sick. You have a hearing your, your case, which is very important to you. doesn't have to get postponed because something happens um, to your attorney. Um, and I, I would say that that's really um, a lot of that, you know, I mean, in some clients, they think they want this, right? We, we, I say this all the time, we don't know what we don't know. You think you want your attorney's personal cell phone and, and to talk to them whenever you want. I, I just am gonna say, I, I don't think you do um, because then if you abuse that, they're not gonna really probably be the best attorney for you. They're gonna get sick of you. Um, and 
they're not going to be as responsive if that process gets abused and uh, they're, you know, they don't have a team to support them. With family law, you know, as our clients, it's just one, this is just your case. And it's the most important thing in the world to you because this is your family and your money. We've got 50 of those, right? If, if the attorney doesn't have boundaries and time to recharge, they're going to burn out and they're really not going to provide you with the best representation, I think, in the long run. So you want an attorney who does have some boundaries, who does take time with their family and to exercise and to refuel so they can come back ready to go, you know, after a day or two off. And when you have a firm, they have paralegals and other support staff that can answer your questions and deal with any emergencies while you know, your attorney has that time off. So I think overall it's better for attorneys but and better for clients um, when they are in a firm. Now, Heather, what do you think? Should I shop around and interview several firms or attorneys? That's a tough question for me to answer, JD, because I think, you know, everybody says, oh, I want three recommendations or I want multiple recommendations. Um, I think it depends on your intent, right? Um, because you're going to spend a lot of money on these consultations. I think you need to be clear about what, are you really, are you really looking for the right attorney? Or is this, which you may not be aware, right? This could be your subconscious really delaying your um, finally making a decision. It's kind of like, you know, you can drive a bunch of cars, but eventually you have to make a decision. But there's, and I know I shared this with the team, there is the perception of perfection and and there is no such thing as perfection and 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 I will say you know that to say oh I am you know I'm a perfectionist well what that means is you very rarely make decisions because nothing's perfect and it allows you to sit back and not make decisions but be looking for just that right fit I think that always the best if you can get a referral right if you have a friend but you know what? They still, the attorney that they chose may not be right for you. Look at, you know, the website, it's hard because people, you know, you have a lot of stuff on the website, but maybe you should think about, well, how was I treated when I called? You know, did I, did somebody really listen to me? Does it seem as though there is a process, a structure there that made me feel comfortable, right? Um, I, I don't think that if you're not comfortable with an attorney, that you should hire them. I, I do think that, and I, or, you know, um, but I, I think that you've, it's gotta be a fit just to say, I think that there, well, there probably is a book and this is not to um, disparage or criticize anyone who may have read it. I think it's divorce for dummies. And cause I had a client many, many years ago and I think they said, it says I've got to interview 10 people. So that's kind of why they're doing it. Or my mom said, I've got to talk to five people. I, you know, I, I'm not going to argue with what your family tells you or whatever, but I am going to uh, suggest that you begin to trust yourself, right? Because you're going through a big process. Did you meet with, you know, somebody when they, when, or when you called their office, did you feel as though that was the right fit? I'm not going to say you should go and talk to five attorneys. But I'm not going to say that just because your neighbor said to use this person, is that the right fit for you or not? Because until you meet with somebody, because there are clients that come see us, JD, and they're not the right fit. Right. They want answers that we're not willing to give, which is because it's not in their best interest. They, um, you know, they just maybe kind of want us to do things that we would say that, you know, ethically, we're not going to do that. Those, that's not going to be the best result for you or, or for our firm. We just don't do that. So not, you know, not everybody is, you know, our cup of tea and we're not everybody else's cup of tea because we want you as a client to want to help yourself, right? We want you to want to be better, even though this is a difficult situation you're in. Not everybody wants that. I mean, I've, I've been told before I was too tough, but then they're like, well, I, we got to have somebody tough. Don't be tough on me. Just be tough elsewhere. You know, it's, right. we can't please everybody all the time. And same for, um, you know, you as a client, you've got to maybe spend some time thinking about, well, what is it I want in an attorney? 
before you go out there and start checking boxes by meeting several. Because if you don't have any criteria for what you're looking for, then why are you meeting with a bunch of people? Because you have no nothing with which to evaluate or make a decision on. All right. Well, thank you, Heather. Let's take a short break. We'll be right back. Listeners, please take a moment to leave us a five-star review below to share our mission of women getting divorce. All right. Well, we are back from our break. And if you missed the first segment, please go back and listen, because today we are um, discussing how to select a divorce attorney most effectively and efficiently. And I am joined by J.D. Fleischer. Uh, my assistant, a member of our team here at Florida Women's Law Group, and she gets to be the one asking questions today. So, uh, JD, let's keep on going. Let's do it. Now, what is the actual process of hiring an attorney? Is it just signing paperwork? What does that all entail? Well, for us, it's a process. Um, you're going to call our office, and and we're going to ask you some questions because we, I mean. We have to have several uh, ways to determine if your issue is something that we can um, we can help you with. Meaning, you know, if you're in South Florida, we can't take that. We're up here in Northeast Florida, so we don't want you coming in for a consultation um, if if it's not an area of the state that we can help you with. So you're gonna you're gonna be asked a lot of questions and to help us determine that, and then we're gonna schedule a consultation. That consultation is going to be with an attorney. And um, and then after that, you know, that's when we determine one, if we, because until you meet with an attorney, we really can't determine if you have a problem that we can solve without getting in a lot of, you know, there are usually jurisdictional issues. There's maybe it's not right, right? You want to change something. So there are a lot of reasons that, that we've got to make that legal decision. And, you know, if maybe what you want to achieve is something we can achieve for you. So that consultation is very important time. We take that very seriously because we're trying to determine if you have a problem that we can solve and if you want our help, right? Because you may not be a good fit. If we want to have you as a client, you it might not be the right fit for us either. So those are all the things that happens at the consultation. And that's when we make the decision both together, um, you know, that you want our help, we want to help you. And then then we go into, okay, let's look at the retainer agreement and, and go through the terms. Because unless you want our help, it's kind of a waste of your time to go into all the paperwork. But yes, you should always sign a retainer. It's a contract between uh, the firm and you as far as who's going to do what what our requirements are um, to you as your attorney and what your responsibilities as a client are for us. Right. Now we talked a lot about clients making sure that they choose an attorney that's the right fit for them. If they have that consultation appointment set, are there any specific questions that they should ask their potential firm or attorney to ensure that that is a good fit? I think you should always ask is what's your process? I think that's really important because you want to know as are, are you going to create a strategy for me? You know, um, and, and what does that look like? And I think you should ask, what's it going to be like? You know, I think the initial questions that people ask are, um, are, are legal, you know, well, what is going to happen with my children? What's going to happen with the money? What's going to happen, um, with the debt? Okay. Those answers are usually dependent on your particular situation. We can find out, it, usually we'll give a range some, because we've only met with you for 45 minutes to, uh, you know, that would be malpractice to say, this is where you're gonna, everything that's gonna happen. We don't have all that data and no attorney should um, do that. And, and you haven't, you know, we've asked you a little bit about what you want, where you wanna be. But we do more of a process and dig into that um, uh, over, um, you know, when we do a strategy session, session, which is part of that. You, we got, we want to know what your goals are, because until we understand your goals and objectives, maybe not where you want to be tomorrow, but where you want to be in three years, then we can really work towards developing that strategy for you. And I don't know that I answered your question, J.D. I think I got <laughs> off on a tangent. 
It's all good. No, I think that's great. Just ensuring that it's a good fit during that consultation appointment. But obviously you mentioned that there's a lot of things that you have to cover during that appointment. And it's really the beginning of your relationship with the attorney. So I think um, you need to know, you know, did they listen to you? Right. Right. I, I mean, or was the attorney talking the whole time? Because mm-hmm. generally the person who's talking isn't listening. So you, you, you want to make sure your attorney is listening to you and that they have a plan at least an initial plan and can say they can help you. Now, this is a great question because I get this a lot here working at our firm in particular. Is it standard for firms to charge a consultation fee? In my experience, yes. Um, But that varies on the type of law. Um, It is, you know, for definitely for the majority of the advertisements in commercials you'll see for attorneys tend to be in the arena of personal injury, medical malpractice. Right. Um, you know, you, you don't pay, you don't pay if we don't get you paid or whatever, you know, unless we get your money, that is a completely different area of law within family law. We do charge a consultation fee. And I find that to be standard, um, in our area up here, I'll tell you why we do because, um, we take that appointment very seriously. Uh, you are going to have a dedicated opportunity with an attorney as well as with our client liaison. And um, I, that's kind of that shopping around, right? If you are, if you're just looking for free consultation, you, you are going to get what you pay for. If you're not really ready to have a serious discussion about your current situation with an attorney and pay for it, you're certainly probably, you may just not be ready, um, but you're not going to be a good fit because um, there's, and there's a lot of studies in psychology, but it's true. People just don't value what's free. And, and we just don't, we just don't do that. Our attorneys have, you know, lots of experience, um, take a lot of time and, and we really don't want to meet with folks who aren't ready to move forward, aren't serious about it or not. Maybe, you know, you may have been served and you may say, I don't want this. Right. But you're, you, you're taking the situation seriously because you've been served with a lawsuit, which just happens to be a divorce. And that's a serious thing. Um, we, we are looking for clients that take that seriously as well. So that's kind of what I had said in the beginning. It is a two-way street. Um, so for us, that, that's a lot of the reasons because of the time um, it, it's um, that you're going to have. And, and you know, we, we feel that the attorneys only have so much time. So um, if you weren't to show, um, someone else missed out on that opportunity. So it is important that it's secured so that, because um, if you're not serious, well, somebody, there will be somebody else who is. So we want to make sure that time goes to somebody who's ready to have a conversation. Right. Absolutely. Now going off of the payment and finances, I know these are a lot of common questions that we get to the firm as well. How exactly does the payment work throughout the divorce process? Is it one price for the entire process? Can you dive into that a little bit more? Sure. Yes. We, um, we charge an initial retainer and then um, the clients are billed for that. We do not have it in place for a, what you would call flat fee. Um, and, and if, you know, those are certainly things that we've looked at because, you know, there's a certain amount of deliverables as your firm that we have to bring to you. And there is, um, there are things that can change. Um, in family law, it's very different than criminal law. Because family law are you and your spouse, right? Going through this and um, your husband's actions can affect a lot of what we do. Your actions affect him, meaning more litigation, things of that nature. Whereas just as an example, criminal law, very straightforward procedure elements. Yes, you have prosecutors on the other side, but it's the the procedure and the process is going to be pretty much what you expect. Um, so it's just a different, different pricing model for different types of cases. Um, and so we usually will quote you a retainer that is not going to cover the entire case, but get you, you know, definitely a third to 
hopefully halfway through the process. Right. Um, now you mentioned a retainer and talked a little bit about that. How exactly is that amount determined? So that is based on our experience and, you know, years of representing people and understanding how, how much a, a similar situated case works, you know, costs based on, you know, what we hear. If, if there is, you know, sometimes let's say people come and hire us and the case is in the middle, um, that is going to be more expensive on the front end because even though you've been with an attorney and maybe a lot of things have happened, we need to get up to speed. And, and the only way to do that is to read the documents, to interview you and, and understand where we are in the case. And then how does that then subsequently affect the issues and, you know, your, um, hopefully your results. So that may be, you know, a case that where we know we're going to do a business valuation, where we have the issues of relocation, um, that, that is just going to require more court time, more, um, working with experts. So because we know that we're going to quote you a retainer that is going to be representative of that. Um, always early on in the firm, I, uh, found the practice of, of, you know, maybe many other firms to be a bit disingenuous and just take a small retainer. Um, but not fully give the client the information on, on this is going to be a lengthy, potentially costly process. I'm not saying it's not going to be worth it, right? Because if these are your goals and objectives, then it's worth it to you. But um, I, you know, we're not going to bring you in on a, oh, oh it's going to cost you only $2,500. And then, mm -hmm. then you're invested and you, you feel like, well, I can't leave because even though I didn't fully appreciate how much this process would cost. So even though some people, and I think a lot of, you know, particularly with our firm, they'll come back to us and say, I wish I had hired you initially, but I thought maybe your retainer was too high. And now I've spent twice that and I'm, I have nothing to show for it. Um, that's one of those things that, you know, we can pretty much tell you, we're, we're just telling you the truth as far as this process and what it's going to cost and the amount of time. If you don't want to hear that, it's pretty easy to go find the answer you want to hear, whether or not that's really going to be the truth down the line. Um, so that that's really how we determine the retainer and why, because we operate on, on integrity and honesty with our clients, even if they don't want to hear what that um, you know reality is going to be. Now, is there a standard for when it comes to billing? Is it via invoice or within a certain time frame? Do you receive an itemized statement like you would for anything else? How does that really work? So I can't speak on what other offices do, but you should be billed twice a month. Um, you should should receive an invoice that shows what work has been done and um, what is remaining in your trust account. We We do it every two weeks, the first and the 15th. You should always know, or the 30th and the 15th, what, twice in a month, you will know what work has been done, um, where your balance of your trust account is. And uh, that's a great way to communicate. You, you know, that's when, it, when we talked at the beginning, the communication. So I'll go back, ask that. How often am I billed and what should I expect? You should, your bill should tell you an absolute, be a story of what has happened, a recollection of everything that's happened in your case. And you should receive those statements frequently so that you're well aware of what is going on. Aside from tracking the progress on your case through the payments, um, should your attorney really be sharing their strategy with you throughout this process? How do you know that, that your attorney's approach is going to be successful for you? Well, that, that's where trust comes into it. Um, that's a conversation that you and your attorney have to have to have is one, they, in order to have a strategy, they have to ask you what your goals and objectives are and where you want to be not only now, but in three years and five years, to the extent that you're able to, to think about that. It's hard when you're in the middle of the divorce. I recognize that to think that far out in the future. But to the extent that you can, that is the only way to build backwards the strategy for you. Um, and and then, you know, you should have a plan as how to achieve that strategy. And you need to absolutely sign off on that and understand 
how your attorney thinks you're going to get there. And I mean, you should, you should agree. You may not understand, but that's why you ask, um, you know, and I mean, we can't guarantee anything, right? Because a judge makes a decision, but we can tell you, you know, whether we think how much of the law is on your side and, you know, these things that you want. And sometimes, you know, individuals and human beings, we, we got to do what we got to do. Right. And we want, we want to go for something, even if, you know, the attorney says, Hey, I think there's only a 25% chance that we're going to achieve that particular result, but there's enough basis for us to do that for you. And there seems to be enough evidence. And then you ultimately need to make that decision as a client. Well, now is a perfect time for our second break. Listeners, we would very much appreciate if you left us a review so that other women going through the divorce process can find our show. Thank you. We are back from our last break. And again today, I'm joined by J.D. Fleischer, and she is interviewing me regarding how to select the best divorce attorney for you. So let's keep going, J.D. Let's do it, Heather. So let's say that you have completed a consultation, you've hired an attorney and their firm, and it's time to start and really dive into the divorce process. What are some signs that you have chosen the right attorney? Well, hopefully, once you've made that initial decision, you feel a bit of relief. You feel like, okay, this is not all on me right now. I have got a team that's going to help me get through this process, which is going to, you know, maybe challenging as, you know, many things are that are worth doing. Um, so I think that's a sign. I think, you know, knowing that um, your attorney has a strategy, that your attorney heard you. Right. We talked about earlier and I said, and I think this is really important for clients, you know, that it was like, Hey, there's only 25% chance we're going to do this. But as a client, they feel like, but I've got, if I don't, I won't be able to live with myself. If I don't really try to achieve this, you know, relocation or these things that are going on with the children and the time sharing, did your attorney hear you? And, and are they able, one, are they able to say, yes, we can go for this, right? There is enough. I think, you know, we will work together with the right experts and evidence to achieve that. So that listening is um, a, a big key. And I think that's a sign that you've chosen the right attorney, that they have heard you. And that then, and many times, you know, the answer might be, I've got to research more, more in depth on how to achieve this result for you or talk to, you know, our other lawyers, but at least they're on board and understand your objectives. I think that's a big part of what we, we all want to be heard and we all want to be understood. Um, you need to make sure they heard you, right? Did they, because I know I, I communicate a lot between staff and children and family and, and they just listen so, or hear me. So you want to verify that. I think that's a really great sign that you have chosen the right attorney. If they can communicate back to you what your goals are, if they understand where you want to be um, and, ha and then they're going to, they're willing to work to try to get you there. Right. You touched on really communicating your goals with your attorney. Um, I know we talked about it a little bit during the consultation process, but truly when is the best time or what is the best way to communicate your clear goal outcomes to your attorney? Well, definitely during a, a, a meeting, an initial meeting where you're talking strategy, um, where they're asking you, they, they should ask you what your goals are, mm -hmm. um, not tell you what your goals should be. Um, that, and, and many times, you know, many of us are sometimes need some quiet space to, to think about that. So maybe you should write them down and, and, and as a client, you know, we talk about the best, you know, you may need to spend some time and really think about where you want to be and write that down and give that to your attorney. Now that could be in an email and, um, but it should be followed up with a conversation because they may not agree. They may say, Hey, out of these five outcomes that you want, I really don't think number two we can get, but like, right. you know, have a conversation that is 
really meaningful based on your specific goals. And, and if you've written them down, that's a pretty clear indication that you've communicated them, right? Your attorney needs to read them and talk to you about them, but you've done your part. Right. Now, how often should you expect to receive updates or communications from your attorney once you've hired them? And does this communication change throughout the process, depending on the stage that you're in? It absolutely does. And, and, and this can be a challenging part, right? Because you've hired your attorney, you've taken this big step forward and, oh my gosh, it's overwhelming, but I did it. Okay. Now, now I got to sit around and wait and that can be frustrating, but a lot of what has to be done initially, once we've gathered a lot of information from you, now you've got to give your attorney some time to do that work. And, and that can take, you know, 10 days, seven to 10 days and say every 10 days you should have some updates or just at least communication from your team, which when I say team, maybe your paralegal that works for the attorney, maybe the legal assistant, you know, somebody saying, okay, hey, because you should review everything before it gets filed and some things you have to sign. So our, like all I can speak about is our office, but that's easy, that's by email. Um, and, and probably most people, some things you have to come into the office to sign. And so I would say, you know, initially that first month you should hear from the team. They should be reaching out to you to gather information. You might need to be reaching out to give them, but it should definitely be almost every week. But then once it's filed, a lot doesn't, sometimes there's not much happening because there's time periods with which for your husband to respond. You know, they get an attorney. So it might seem as though nothing's going on, but what is going on is they have their time to respond. That is by the law. So during that time, it may be just every two weeks. Um, and and you should ask, right? Because this is your first time doing this as a client. So you are relying on your attorney, your team to tell you, okay, you can expect basically what to expect. Right. That maybe that should be the next book, JD. What to expect <laughs> when you're divorcing, right? I, I might I love that it. might be some it. that might be some copyright or trademark <laughs> infringement from we'll that. What to expect mm -hmm. when you're uh what to expect when you're expecting. When you're expecting. That's right. That's the thing. Well, but um that is our job as an attorney. And I will tell you, as our firm, we communicate that in many different ways. Can it be better? Yes, we're always working on that, right? Like, hey, here's your roadmap. This is what you should expect. Right. Sometimes there may be um, some issues that the communication is going to be more frequent. That will be when maybe there's been emergency type situations, um, which no one expected, where maybe there's illness, injury, something typically with the children, maybe with you or your husband. So those, you know, that can change. Um, so it, there is not one answer, but I will tell you, it's not every day. Mm -hmm. That is not realistic and it's not sustainable. Um, there are not that many legal issues happening every day. So it's best to know when the next time you're going to talk to them and, and have your questions and concerns ready. Right. Now you mentioned that divorce can be an overwhelming or frustrating process at times. Is switching attorneys an option when you're already going through this process? And how do you know if it's really time to find another attorney? Boy, that's a tough one, JD. Um, so sometimes you and your attorney will reach an impasse. And that has certainly happened where, where you as a client want to go one way and your attorney says, I, I, I can't do that for you. I am not going to pursue that avenue with you. So um, that that's one. And they say, I'm going to withdraw. You know, I know, and I know this from clients who have come to our firm um, from another firm and they've lost confidence or trust. And that's really tough because, and I, I, I've certainly said this more than once, that it could be a great result. But if you've lost trust, you're just not going to trust it. And that's hard. So it's like any relationship. If that trust has been broken, if you can repair that, that, that would be good. Right. But, um, you know, and, and I know sometimes, you know, um, but yes, you can switch attorneys. You need to be really careful about it and thoughtful. Um, I, I understand no clients really, that's not their desire. It's just, right. they get to a point, maybe they're like, you're not aggressive enough. I don't think you were prepared enough. 
um, you're not listening to me on what I've asked to do, or you're taking too long. A lot of things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, that are just things that happen. Some maybe as a result, it's usually probably it was not the right fit um, between the client and the attorney. Um, and at that point, you just, you know, you, you make an appointment with an attorney. If you, once you've found that other attorney, the attorney handles that communication. Um, you know, a reason not to switch is that you owe your attorney a bunch of money or any amount of money, and then, you know, want to go get someone else. Now you may have reasons, you know, whatever for that issue, but understand that they don't have to give your file to this new attorney when um, you owe them money. And so then that creates problems. So at least be upfront with the new attorney that you're talking to about what's going on, because we're going to find out. And we, we, we want to know, well, why are you leaving this firm? Because maybe you're just wanting answers that they're not going to give you. And, and we might not either, or a new attorney might not, you know, say, yes, you, you I think you can achieve X, Y, Z. So it, that's a tough thing. It does happen. Um, and, and sometimes it's mutual. Sometimes it's the attorney fires the client. Sometimes right. the client fires the attorney. And um, it, it's usually not really personal, but something has happened where you're just really no longer both after the same objective. This process of switching attorneys, um, do you need permission to do this? Do you have to alert of the opposing party or the judge if you're that far into the process? Kind of what does that look like? Absolutely. So when you have an attorney, we are on, we are on the hook. We are your attorney as far as that judge is concerned. And so sometimes, even though um, we may have agreed, hey, we're not compatible you still have to answer calls from opposing counsel. You still have to appear at things until there's a court order that says you're no longer the attorney and this new person's the attorney. So it it usually shouldn't take long. Um, um, it can take longer because of maybe attorneys and, and sometimes the judges, I will say, they can be a little slow sometimes. Um, so yes, it is basically is permission. It is getting that, permission to substitute a new attorney. So that can be really frustrating for clients. So you got to ask if you are doing that, like how long is that going to take and what's the process? It, it, it seems simple until you get into it. And it's just, you know, those pleadings need to be filed and a court order needs to be done before say you come in today, hire a new attorney and say, okay, I need a court date. We can't even do anything officially until the judge has signed. Uh, we can do stuff in the office, but we can't contact the court, get new hearings until the judge has signed that order. So that can be frustrating. If a client does decide to switch attorneys, do you think that they are starting over? Does the whole process start over? How does that work? There's going to be a slight delay. There's no doubt just because the, uh, the new attorney has to get up to speed. But sometimes you're like, well, it's been so delayed or you're not starting over. Sometimes you, maybe you wish you were, um, and you're not. So, um, but it is fresh eyes on, on the situation. Um, there is going to be a lag that hopefully it, you're making the choice to, you know, to hire somebody you're better aligned with. And then that is going to end up being worth it. But yes, I, I it, it's impossible for it to not be a slight delay. My last question for you, Heather, is really how is success measured in family law at the end of the day? Is it a wind rate or a dollar amount in your opinion? What is it? In my opinion, it is whether or not you have achieved your goals. I, as this show is called Women Winning Divorce, and my point of view is that you can win by achieving your goals. And if you have achieved your goals, you have won. Right. It is not about making somebody else lose. It's, um, you know, if that's what you're going into it, that nobody wins, right? That pound of flesh, that that's right. not positive for anybody, but, um, the, if you can achieve your goals and if you can move on with your life and start over, that's a win. All right. Well, we have reached the end of our show. Thank you so much to JD for joining us this week and asking some really insightful questions that will hopefully help our listeners. Of course, Heather, I'm so glad I could help out today. Well, thank you. And if you or someone you know is going through a divorce or is thinking about a divorce, please reach out to us at floridawomenslawgroup.com. 
We also have a Facebook group, Women Winning Divorce. We'd love for you to become a part and you know join other women uh, in inspiring and encouraging them through this process. The link will be below in the episode description. Thank you for listening. And please, again, uh, leave us a review. If you enjoyed the show, that will help other listeners find our content. From being served to preparing for trial, Divorce 101 will prepare you end-to-end for the divorce process. I'm Heather Quick, attorney and CEO of Florida Women's Law Group. Join us over the next six weeks to feel empowered and educated about a complex and often challenging legal process. Our online course is designed to provide an overview of what to expect what to prepare for, and offer guidance you may need to succeed and win at life. Over six weeks of video and additional resources, we are confident that you will finish our course feeling inspired and educated. Find out more at floridawomenslawgroup.com forward slash divorce 101 or call us at 904-567-0121. Thank you again. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Women Winning Divorce. My goal is to elevate your life and the way you are thinking so that you are best equipped to win at life. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe so you automatically get my new shows every week. And I would love to hear from you personally. Come join the conversation on social and join our Facebook group, Women Winning Divorce. We welcome your comments and suggestions. We want to bring you content that helps move your life forward. Women Winning Divorce is the place for an elevated conversation on how women can thrive during times of adversity in order to live their best life.